they were. Let me ask you to turn to Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And I forgot, forgot to ask, chapel is over at 11.50? 11.50, okay, that's, uh, that gives me uh, almost two hours then, Pacific Coast time. So uh, uh, I will get hungry, so we'll quit sooner. So Proverbs chapter 1, how many of you read a chapter in the book of Proverbs every day or have done so at some point in your life? Wonderful, wonderful. How many read maybe five psalms every day? Um, okay, there's several ways to do that. Psalm 1 through 5 on the first day, 6 through 10 the second day, or uh, you, can, you can do it by 30s because there's 150 chapters and that's a good way to do it too. But Psalm, uh, Proverbs chapter 1 verses 1 through 5 happened to be in my reading for this morning. I thought, what a good introduction to chapel. Uh, follow with me if you would. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. And he speaks to knowing wisdom and instruction. Uh, verse 2 to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and, in, and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Let's begin with prayer. Lord, thank you for uh, this good day before us. And Lord, this time to again be reminded of the wonderful truths of your word and the wonderful relationship that you want to have with us day by day. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the opportunities of this coming uh, school year in junior, senior high and college. And uh, Lord, we're grateful for uh, that time, that season of life of uh, of training and yet serving. And uh, Lord, just continue to equip in a wonderful way for your service in whatever days we have left. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've already forgotten the name of the young lady who came up to me ahead of chapel and said, you were here four years ago. And I thought, four years ago, I can't hardly believe. Four years has passed. Who was that? Right there. Yes. Your name again? Samantha. Samantha. McNabb. Are you the one for whom the college remembers save the books? All right, I wanted, to, I wanted to reconnect. I don't know how many times those words have rung through my head and you're gonna to have to ask her for the story. It's, I, I appreciate her loyalty to books. Uh, I, I, <laughs> Kindred spirit, that's all I can say. Just, uh, just a kindred spirit. And uh, <laughs> thank you, Samantha. I think you kind of buzzed through your name so I wouldn't make the connection. Uh, but thank you for saving the books. Um, so five things I want to share with you today. And it's, it's just basic, it's foundational. Um, first of all, I want to speak to you. The word you appears 983 times in the New Testament. I'll be honest with you, I didn't look up every one of those verses. Um, but God is interested in you. He is. Every one of you. And I'm going to begin these five thoughts with the word you. You are in a great place. I've appreciated uh, this ministry over the years and uh, um, just... Um, before I mention a little bit of history, how many of you are seventh graders? Wonderful, wonderful, hands high, seventh grade. Okay, good. And then uh, freshman in college. Excellent, excellent. I've heard already about the freshman class. And uh, girls, you're in for a treat this year. Just wait four years or more, okay, or whatever your parents ask of you. Um, but uh, it's a new season of life, especially if, how many are, are new to the college? Maybe not seventh grader or freshman, but you're new this year to the high school or the college good. If you haven't met Nathan Doring, one of those who raised his hand, hailed for some years from Oregon, now moved to the liberal, uh, I mean conservative state of Idaho. Uh, everybody's leaving Oregon, um, as they are California. But 
Um, all in God's plan. And you are from where? Okay, good. Good for you. Good for you for being here. My daughter, uh, before she married the fellow that became my son-in-law, attended here many years ago. And it was generally about the same time as the Dameron's, the Armacost, and others. In other words, back in the last century. Um, and uh, they thrived here and uh, so enjoyed their time here. And more recently, your pastor's daughter, Jennifer Dameron and Allison Gunsenhauser have joined us in what I'm calling the mission field of Oregon. It is, it is in many respects, indeed, a mission field. Mr. Jericho, whom I understand is in the Chicago area working in a Christian school, helped us a year ago when we were under um, what I'll call COVID lockdown in trying to do a, a modified NBT, um, uh, primarily remotely, but he helped us wonderfully. And then uh, Mr. Colton, um, Mr. Daniel came and joined us with NBT this year. And that brought back old memories because, um, um, let's see, um, David, let's see, David is the son of Mr. Ed Krigo, if I got this right, who was an NBT evangelist somewhere between 25 and 30 years ago. And then um, um, Daniel Hodges, son of Jason Hodges, his father was also an NBT evangelist. So when you get fathers and then 25, 30 years later, sons being NBT evangelists, that's pretty exciting. And uh, the next step is grandchildren coming back and being NBT evangelists. So that's a blessing. But you're in a great place. You're in a great time. It's a time, number two, where you have great potential that God wants to further fine tune and mold and make you. And you're in good company as others before who in their younger years were greatly used of God. Evan Roberts and his youth group, 1904, Brother Armacos probably remembers that, uh, back in uh, Swansea, um, uh, Wales, saw a, a revival that really uh, spread around the world. And it all started with a young man, Evan Roberts, who just had a heart for God and uh, challenged his young people. And they collectively ended up impacting the church at large and seeing a great, great revival in Wales. I had the opportunity to be in Wales. My wife and I were visiting the Leek family years ago when there were missionaries there. And I'll never forget going down to downtown Swansea with Brother Leek while my wife and his wife were fellowshipping. And as we went, uh, we would see burned out cars along the roadway. So what is this? He said, well, there's 40% unemployment here and the young folks are kind of bored and they steal cars, and the more alarm systems they have on them, the more fun it is for them. And the, when the police get close, they bail out, torch the car, and run. And what a mission field. Well, what's happened in 100 years? You say, well, that's a long time. Well, our life is seemingly for you, maybe stretching out before you to be a long time before you, but life goes quickly. And a heart on fire for God can grow cool if we're not careful. So God used Evan Roberts. God used James Frazier going back in time a little bit to the early 1900s. Uh, also, he was a young missionary from Great Britain, went to the south part of China and worked among the Lisu people up in the hill country. They didn't have a written language. He trekked the hills and his Diaries contain unbelievable accounts of the dangers, of the, the difficulty of the terrain, but he had a heart to share the gospel. And in doing so, he developed a printed language as a young uh, single missionary uh, that's today called the Fraser Script. And the Lisu people, one of those major southern people groups in China, uh, spreading down into the southern uh, countries below China as well, especially during World War II, uh, he had an impact that endures even to this day. Some years ago, my wife and I had an opportunity to be in southern China, Kunming, 
visiting with a missionary, and he told us this story. He said, my, 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 my children, who are teens, were able to go up into the hill country of outside Kuming, southern China, and visit the Lisu people, and, and she said, they're still using the hymnals he collected, he was very musical, he collected and put into their language for the Lisu people, they're using it even to this very day, 80 plus years later. Young person, making an impact. You have energy. You have, as God gives you vision, you can maintain that focus for souls. And uh, thank you, by the way, those who signed up to help with setup tomorrow afternoon. That's just volunteering to be part of a ministry that is trying to do something for God, and you are doing something for the Lord here. Well, uh, Eric Liddell would be another young man greatly used of God. He, uh, he just purposed that he was going to honor God with his running, and uh, because he didn't want to run on Sunday, uh, they assigned him another event in the Olympics. He ended up winning a gold in a different event than was his event, as I remember the story. I think it was the 24 Olympics, if I'm remembering. And, and uh, he ended up being offered many uh, attractive um, advertisement opportunities. And he said, no, I, w I just feel like uh, I need to return to China, my roots, where my parents were missionaries and uh, spend my life for the cause of Christ. We had a lady come to visit our church, gave her testimony on a Wednesday, uh, Sunday night maybe. Her name was Mrs. Horton. She said this, she said, I was an eight-year-old girl in the POW camp during World War II, and Eric Liddell ran the youth programs in our POW camp for the missionary children. She said, I got acquainted with him. He was a godly, uh, a younger man who was wonderfully, by that time he was a little older than young. Of course, anybody 80 and below is young, but he, he was uh, uh, serving God, died in that concentration camp of something that could have been operable if he'd gotten medical care stateside. I just share those quick three things to say, be encouraged. You don't know how God's going to use you. Don't limit him. Don't think, who am I? Well, don't think, who am I? I am me, uh, in pride, because God knows how to humble the proud. But you have great, great potential. Two quick scriptures I would remind you of. Paul, writing to Timothy, said, Let no man despise thy youth. Be thou an example. And notice these things that he mentions in word, in conversation, manner of living, in charity, in attitude of a heart of love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. That's a packed verse. Paul writes to Titus, similarly, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. We call Timothy and Titus those two younger preachers that Paul mentored and, and in a sense trained and sent to, to, the, to do the work of the ministry. So you're in a great place, your great time of your life. You have great potential. Thirdly, is so basic, your daily walk with God is a great and a crucial matter. We all need daily time with God. Four years ago, I was reminded of being here four years ago, I referred to this concept. I want to review it because it's, it, it comes from a little book uh, that was written by Charles Dyer, um, uh, called 30 Days in the Land of the Psalms, but he highlights Psalm 134. There are 15 psalms, 120 to 134, that are known the songs of psalms of degree or songs of ascent. And that 134th chapter has three verses in it. Look at it very quickly, if you would, because as the people are journeying to Jerusalem on their three annual pilgrimages that they would do, they would sing as they went. How many of you like to sing while you work? How many of you like to sing while you're studying? The girls do that better than us fellas. They can, they can multitask, but um, we're kind of simple, single-minded folks. Maybe I'm just confessing for myself, but uh, I like to pull all the other men into it with me. Um, 
we, we, we need to focus on, on God and his word and stick to the basics. And we need to be reminded of some things. And, and how many of you ever worked a graveyard? How many worked a swing shift? How many worked a day shift? How many work? Okay. If you've worked night shift, graveyard is rough. That's rough. I had a job in college unloading railroad cars. And the graveyard shift was, was a rough go. And, uh, and there were some people in Jerusalem that had night shift. Look at Psalm 134, if you would. This psalm, we believe, comes about, it's one of the songs that they sang as they would travel up to Jerusalem and as they would return back home. But it's a psalm that has to do with their departure from Jerusalem. Look at it, if you would. Behold, and let, let me tell you who's speaking. The people are speaking to the priests. Okay, verses one and two. Behold, bless ye the Lord all ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. What are the priests doing standing by night in the house of the Lord? Well, to understand that, we go to Exodus chapter 27. Let me just read verses 20 and 21. Thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil, olive, beaten for the light, notice this, to cause the lamps to burn always in the tabernacle of the congregation without or outside the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron his son shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. Goes on to say, it shall be a statute forever under the generations on the behalf of the children of Israel. If you've ever seen a menorah, and uh, there is a, a literal golden menorah, a seven um, uh, lamp candle, stand uh, that is out in a well-guarded glass cage in the plaza overlooking the Western Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. The Temple Institute, I'll refer to them tomorrow, the Temple Institute is making articles for the next temple. We call it the third temple. The menorah is one of those things that was in uh, Solomon's temple. It was one of those things that um, was in the temple in Jerusalem when Jesus was there before his destruction in, uh, in 70 AD. What did the priests do? Made sure there was enough olive oil in uh, the, the little basins. Made sure that the wicks were trimmed. Made sure that the temple area was clean after the pilgrims would visit the temple each and every day and those priests had night shift, and the, the, the pilgrims, the, the, the Jewish pilgrims, the Hebrew pilgrims would understand that. And so they're, they're saying in their departure from the temple to the priests, bless ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. And they're, they're just encouraging these priests understanding that they often pull night shift duty. And as they're departing, thank you. Thank you for your service to the Lord. Thank you for your prayers unto God, uh, to the Lord, and our, on our behalf. Bless ye. And so as um, they depart, then the priests respond in verse 3, the Lord that made heaven and earth bless thee out of Zion. Those who know Hebrew music have come to the conclusion that this is kind of the sense of way this, this psalm was used. So think of it as these priests are pulling night shift, they are doing service unto the Lord. And in their night shift work unto the Lord, they are acknowledging that God is central and key in their lives and in the lives of the people. We need that same, same mindset. I, uh, I, I have um, four men right now that I am, uh, have uh, some daily accountability. And it's very simple, just a prayer emoji. When I start my time with God, I, I send one prayer hand. When I finish, I send two. And... and uh, 
and they reciprocate. We don't always even send a verse, often we'll do. But um, one particular younger man, every once in a while I'll notice some days go by and I'm not hearing much and, and I'll, uh, I'll say something really tactful like, are you starving? Are you, are you getting your daily bread spiritually? Or I'll, I'll text something like this, um, no, no, no Bible, no breakfast. No Bible, no bread. And then I found out one of his, um, one of his favorite little uh, delights are crumble cookies. And so I texted him, uh, no Bible, no crumble cookies. Trying to make it as pertinent and as straightforward as I can. And uh, I got the freedom to do, to do that with him because he's related to me. Well, um, accountability is so important. We need daily time with God. God puts it this way. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide, abide in the vine, no more uh, can, uh, can ye. We need that time with God. And so... It's important. I, I, I have a, a gentleman's farm. It consists of one grape vine and a few other odds and ends. Uh, a couple weeks ago, a deer, two deer, came wandering through our backyard. We live in the city, sort of, and, and they were chomping on roses. They were chomping on our grapes. They were chomping on... on um, our raspberries, their chump, everything they could find. And I, I went out to scare them away, and they were having such a good time they wouldn't scare until one scared me. He jumped out from under the, part, the end of the deck. He was just catching a little snooze. And, and I went out to see what the damages were, and I, I ended up clipping some ends of those vines. And a couple days later, you know, they're, they're dying. They're dead. They're on the ground. Why? They're not attached to the vine anymore. And we're going to dry up and wither and become very unproductive if we're not attached to the vine. Um, the, the, a couple of verses later, John 15 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Now that's learning to pray in harmony with uh, the word of God and as the spirit of God prompts us. It's amazing how... Prayer warriors have that reputation of discerning the will of God, learning to pray within the will of God, and even ahead of time saying, I believe God's got the answer already on the way. God wants us to grow to that place where we have that kind of, of growing relationship with him. Now, to have time with God every day is going to involve responding to the work of the Holy Spirit Paul said in Acts 24, 16, Herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. How many of you have roommates this year? Glorious roommates. They're wonderful. But I'll, I'll, I'll just remind us, everybody has idiosyncrasies. What's an idiosyncrasy? Something my roommate does, I don't, and it irritates me. <laughs> well, I'll have them. Even in marriage, there will be idiosyncrasies between your spouse and yourself. And uh, it, it's just, it, it's God's character building time. I, I, I've, I, I can tell you about two roommates I had, but I don't have time to do it. Just say, God does a wonderful work of grace, probably looking back on it, more in him than me. But uh, it's a time where you've got to keep your conscience clear. You've got to just, just make sure that as best you can, your spirit is right one with another. And then in this matter of daily walking with God, let me give you a little bit of vision and don't misuse these verses. Psalm 119 verse 98 says that it's through God's commandments that he will make you wiser than your enemies. We like that. The next verse says, verse 99, that you will have, be careful, more understanding than your teachers. Don't misuse that. Um, I, I think the context there, as you look at the verse, simply has, has to do with the fact that as you learn under those here who are teaching, mentoring you, 
Um, and then you think about it. That verse says, because you meditate on God's testimonies. You see how God has worked out in a life of those who are teaching you and you learn from them. And every one of us who teach others want people to go further than we want ourselves. Parents want that. Teachers want that. I had a, had a professor in, uh, in college and I enjoyed him, but the reality was he was dry. His, 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 uh, his expertise was history. And he had a wonderful monotone voice. And uh, uh, I would sit there, and, uh, and I was, uh, I was uh, serving in a church uh, 30 uh, minutes away. I was uh, uh, driving school bus four hours a day. I was testing out of some other classes. And I'd get sleepy. And one day, like I see one young man right now, just, just little eyes a little closed there. Um, just kind of wondering if he can keep them open because he's been working hard. And I found myself falling out of my chair. And as I fell, I spotted my pencil that fell ahead of me. And I made a point of picking it up. And then came those words, my name and like to see you after class. Now, he never looked at us while he was teaching. Why he saw me, I don't know. But we had a wonderful chat after class. Um, and uh, God was merciful and gracious and so loving because what he wanted to see me was he wanted me to assist him by grading the exams. And it was a little paid position. I was so grateful. God blinded him uh, momentarily. <laughs> but uh, uh, Dr. Mitchell in the back, he may not blind him. He may, he may see you as he's teaching. What, I, what I'm saying is, as I served him, I'll never forget a little statement he had on his desk. No one much went into his office, but he said, I met my classes. Got to thinking, he's a faithful man. And by the way, as I endeavored to listen, the guy had a wealth of knowledge. He really was, he really knew his stuff. I met my classes. I was faithful. Been challenged by that. I hope you meet your classes, not just physically but you're giving attendance. And then as you learn, you put it into practice. Number four, quickly, I've only got an hour 30 left. All right, you, you, your daily walk with God is great and of a crucial matter. Four, you learn from those who go before. Um, uh, uh, by the way, verse 100 says, I understand more than the ancients. We stand on the shoulders of those who went before. And I've enjoyed the writings of good folks. Scripture says, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. First Corinthians 10 says, verse five, with many of them, God's reviewing the history of Israel. God was not well pleased, why? Because they didn't obey him. They were overthrown in the wilderness. And then he writes, verse six, these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Verse 11 says, similarly, now all these things happened unto them for examples. They were written for our admonition. And then a little warning, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So as you're, as you're learning from those who go before, uh, learn. Uh, how many times have we heard teachers or parents say, uh, I learned this the hard way. We say, wow. Tell me, I don't want to go learn that the hard way. We learn from those who go before. And the Bible is full of examples of those who knew but did not do. One of the key ones was Solomon. Knew, wisest of men. And yet he didn't do what he knew. And shortly after his death, the kingdom split and was never the same again. So. Um, let us learn from those who go before. And then number five, decision point. What am I going to do? Am I going to take my time with God each day? Am I going to listen and learn and ap uh, apply that which has come my way from others? We need to know the Lord. We need to grow in him. We need to let him help mow the weeds out of our life. We need to walk in daily obedience or we will grieve him and he cannot work through us like he would like to. We limit him. 
We even bring consequences of living in the flesh our way. One day, uh, my wife came home from service and she said, I had a chance to talk with so-and-so. And she, sh she shared with me an item that she allowed to creep into her life and it became an addiction. And my wife had an opportunity just to share with her some things about getting victory and freedom from an addiction. And there's all kinds of things that become addictive. All the way from drugs and alcohol and pornography to an overused hobby. Um, let me caution, and I know, I know um, the ministry here works hard to help you in the area of using your time wisely. But how many people in the world today are spending hours and hours and hours in video games? I just saw recently a headline, China is now limiting the young people to three hours of video per week. They're seeing <laughs> the need uh, to use time wisely. Well, uh, I want to close with an illustration of how our decisions will help or hurt us. If you would turn to Ezekiel, I just finished this last Sunday my 30th message from the book of Ezekiel and closed out chapter 48. I thought, as I reflected back on the book of Ezekiel, that there is a thread of something that you might um, find helpful. And this thread has to do with God's faithful working with Israel. And Ezekiel was a prophet who had been taken captive during the second invasion by Nebuchadnezzar and in, uh, against Jerusalem, and he's on the uh, bank, Shabar, it's, it's called the river, it's, it was a canal-type river in, uh, in Babylon, and he's preaching. He was called and commissioned um, about the age of 30, taken captive at the age of 25, and there's a series of messages that come throughout the book of Ezekiel. And... Um, the book of Ezekiel is, is warning after warning after warning, and he is preaching to the captives. Now you'd think, if you'd been taken captive, you'd be more receptive to truth, but he had, most of the people just came to hear what new thing he was going to share from God, but they didn't have any intention of obeying it. And the messages had to do, up through chapter 24, as to what God is going to do in Jerusalem shortly. And God is warning the people in Jerusalem, you are going to be invaded and Jerusalem's going to be just, uh, ransacked and basically destroyed. The in-resident prophet you've heard of, contemporary of Ezekiel, was Jeremiah. He's called the weeping prophet. Why? He wept over the sins of the people and the majority of whom would not repent and get right with God and then do right. And sure enough, the bottom line of that story was, Jerusalem fell, just like God prophesied it into the future. Let me take you through a little sequence, if I could, very briefly. And I see the clock is fast forwarded till our closing time. But let me share this so quickly with you. In verse number four of chapter eight, the glory of God was there. Where? In Jerusalem. The mercy seat, the cherubims, the Ark of the Covenant. The glory of God manifested by cloud uh, by day, a pillar of fire by night. The glory of God was there. Chapter 9, verse 3. The glory of God of Israel was gone up from the cherub to the threshold of the house. What's happening? The Spirit of God was grieved because of the sin of the people. In fact, God highlights in chapter 7 and 8, 70 men plus women who were worshiping uh, Tammuz, the Babylonian fertility god, who's going to take them out anyway. Um, and he says the glory of God uh, was, was on the threshold of the house. The glory, the physical manifestation of God moved from the place of the Holy of Holies that 
spilled out into all of the, the temple and is now at the threshold, the, the, the doorway. And, and God is helping Ezekiel to understand that, that when people sin, it grieves God and he, he, he departs. And for us, it's not that we lose our salvation, we lose our fellowship, we lose our communion, we lose our, our, our power of seeing uh, uh, God answer prayer and being used in the lives of others. Chapter 10, the glory of God went up from the, uh, the threshold, stood over the threshold of the house. But in verse 18 of chapter 10, the glory of God departed from off the threshold of the house. And when you get down to verse number 23 of chapter 11, the glory of God went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain. What's happening? The spirit of God is the glory of God is retreating. He yearns to return. It's as if he's on the threshold begging the people to respond. He wants to come back and be all that he wants and they need him to be in their lives. And then you get to chapter 10 and, and he's departed from off the threshold. Next you see him out on the mountain side looking back as it were. And the people uh, are, are, are choosing to be oblivious to the tug and pull of God's heart. When God speaks to your heart, respond to him. And, 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 uh, and if you're not quite sure, is that the spirit of God or my own thinking? Sometimes uh, time of the word, uh, a bit of counsel is helpful. Uh, God's never going to lead us apart from the truths of his word. And he's going to use the counselors in our lives. And, and many of you are kind of away from home now, but you have the capability to touch and base with home. And you have uh, wonderful uh, mentors here that can help you. But God, God wants to be close and near and dear, and he's just waiting. Well, let's fast forward to the end of Ezekiel. And there's much Bible prophecy in those later chapters. But we're going to fast forward to a time when in the millennial kingdom reign, the full return of God. Now, I believe God's been at work in Israel. Uh, uh, 1917, things we could share about God setting up an umbrella of protection through the British mandate that extended up until 1947, 1948, when Britain left and Israel declared its independence and became a nation again. The only time in history that that's happened that way, because God still has a plan for Israel as a nation in his mercy. And you get to the end of chapter 48 and you find these words. The name of the city, where? There. In fact, in fact when, Hez when, when Ezekiel saw it twice, and where we find there toward the end, chapter 44, I fell upon my face when the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the name of the city was called, the Lord is there. That's the same phrase that started the book back in chapter 8. The glory of the Lord of Israel was there. People may look at you and say, God is at work in their life. God's using that young person. God has great potential in a future. God is there at work. Keep him there with you. Keep him at the center. Spend time with him. Oh, we can do many things in life. I knew a fellow one time uh, years ago who said, he said, my goal in life was to come up, become, this was, this was back, uh, uh, back with Brother before even Brother Armacost was alive. And uh, he said, my goal was to become a millionaire by the time I'm 30. I'd well, probably be like being a hundred millionaire today. He said, God got a hold of my, and he had gifts, he had talent, he had, but he said, God got a hold of my heart and I just want to invest in young people. And God used him wonderfully. And it is worth it all when we'll see Jesus. And his rewards are beyond anything we can ever imagine. The glory of the Lord filled the house. The name of the city, the Lord, is there. As you bow your heads.